actually getting a sense of the, the science that they did, their approach to understanding the weather, to have a sense of whether or not they just blindly sauntered out into Antarctica not knowing what would happen, or whether they actually tried to figure out what they ought to expect. Solomon was surprised to discover just how attentive Scott had been to the weather and just how determined Simpson had been to understand it. Long before the advent of modern forecasting equipment, they had attempted something that had never been done in Antarctica. They had based their schedule on a prediction of the weather. Simpson very carefully tried to understand what the weather should be like. To figure out how you'd get to the pole and get back, the weather was going to be a key component of that process, and Scott's writings make it clear that he was worried about that, that he and Simpson talked about it. He wrote in his diaries many times, the temperature is minus 17, inform Simpson. You know, remember to talk about this with Simpson. In Simpson, Scott had found a man who matched his own passion for science. Simpson had been born into a family of umbrella makers in Derby, England. His father established a department store bearing the family name, and Simpson was expected to follow in his father's footsteps but the boy showed an uncanny ability in science and instead became the first member of his family to go to university. His advisor there was a personal friend of Scott's and he recommended Simpson for the polar expedition. He was an amazing guy. The insights that, that Simpson had into many different aspects of Antarctic meteorology are, are just incredible. Uh, he was the first to figure out why the Antarctic summer is colder than the Arctic summer. He was the first to really launch balloons in the Antarctic and study how the temperatures changed as a function of altitude, which was a, a really stunning achievement. Uh, he was clearly a scientist of, of tremendous capability. As Solomon pored over the data in Simpson's papers, she realized she was looking at something truly remarkable. In front of her, on the yellowing pages of century-old diaries, were the first ever forecasts of the Antarctic interior. Composed from Simpson's observations in the year prior to the push for the pole, Solomon examined every detail of the forecasts. I wasn't prepared for what I found looking at Simpson's books and other documents. It's incredible to me that, that he was able to piece together enough information about the weather to make a remarkably accurate forecast for what the conditions ought to have been like for the journey to the pole and the entire journey back. The way he did that was, was just amazing. Simpson predicted that the temperature at the Cape Evans base camp would be warmer than the Antarctic interior. Not simply because of the natural warming effect of the ocean, but also because the nearby mountains blocked the cold winds coming off the ice shelf. He built a weather station just above the hut, where readings of temperature, wind speed, and wind direction were taken on an hourly basis. To get data from the interior, he trained the men to take temperature readings three times a day on every one of their depot supply journeys. By comparing the records from the depot trips with the corresponding measurements from Cape Evans, Simpson came to the conclusion that throughout the year, the ice shelf was consistently 20 degrees colder than Cape Evans. From his findings, he was able to forecast the temperature on the ice shelf for every month of the polar journey. Simpson's approach was years ahead of its time, but it remained to be seen how accurate his predictions really were. Over the last 20 years, Technology has allowed modern scientists to learn a great deal about Antarctica's weather patterns. One of the most powerful tools in this quest to unravel the continent's secrets is a network of automated weather stations that gather temperature, wind, and other meteorological data every day of the year, sending it via satellite to labs around the world. Examining this archive, Solomon was quickly able to work out typical temperatures for every month of Scott's journey. When she compared her modern results to Simpson's 1911 predictions, she was amazed to discover that Simpson's forecasts 
were never more than three degrees off. How cold would it be at the pole in January? He figured that out. How cold would it be on the ice shelf? How cold would it be on the last part of the journey? He had all of that nailed to, to a T. When Scott left the pole, he was relying on Simpson's forecast for the return journey. He had planned his schedule around the temperatures he knew he could expect, and so far, everything had gone according to plan. The team made its way back across the high plateau, and as Simpson had predicted, temperatures hovered near a frigid negative 25 degrees Fahrenheit. The party was averaging more than 15 miles a day, but Edgar Evans was suffering from worsening frostbite, and his situation was getting serious. Evans was beginning to lose heart. Evans is the chief anxiety now. His cuts and wounds suppurate. His nose looks very bad. And altogether, he shows considerable signs of being played out. Things may mend for him on the glacier, and his wounds get some respite under warmer conditions. The men's spirits rose when they arrived back at the Beardmore. But on the way down, Evans sustained a severe head injury when he and Scott fell into a crevasse. Scott had hoped the warmer temperatures on the ice shelf would help Evans recover. But after the accident, his situation began to look hopeless. His comrades encouraged him to push on. But two weeks later, Evans collapsed. I was first to reach the poor man and shocked at his appearance. He was on his knees with clothing disarranged and a wild look in his eyes. We got him on his feet, but after two or three steps, he sank down again. He showed every sign of complete collapse. Wilson, Bowers and I went back to the sledge while Oates remained with him. When we returned, he was practically unconscious and we got him into the tent quite comatose. He died quietly at 12.30 a.m. Frostbite had taken its toll, but Wilson, the team doctor, documented the cause of death as brain damage. Evans had been done in by a freak accident, something no amount of planning could have prevented. There was nothing the team could do but bury him and move on. With Evans gone, the men quickened their pace. The day after they buried their friend, Scott, Wilson, Oates and Bowers approached their resupply depot near the base of the glacier. They were finally back on the ice shelf. Here, stockpiles of food and fuel awaited them. At last, the frigid temperatures of the plateau were supposed to be behind them. Simpson's forecast called for strong tailwinds and much more moderate temperatures. They were still 400 miles away from Cape Evans, but they expected the worst was behind them. The very first night that they regained the barrier, Scott talked about how they've had a good night's sleep for a change because it was so nice and warm. They weren't even worried when they got back down to the Ross Ice Shelf. At that point, they thought they had it made. For the next six days, everything went according to plan. But on February 27th, the temperature suddenly dropped to a brutal 37 degrees below zero. This was far worse than anything they had experienced on the plateau. For the first time, a hint of uncertainty entered Scott's writing desperately cold last night. Pray God we have no further setbacks. We may find ourselves in safety at next depot, but there is now a horrid element of doubt. The doubts did not let up. Brief periods of such bitter cold were manageable, but for days the thermometer refused to budge, only once rising above negative 30. The men were stunned by the unexpected weather. Wilson and Bowers had survived worse temperatures on an earlier research expedition. 
but never for this long, and never after four months of exhausting manholing. It's not just the fact that it was cold. It was cold for three and a half straight weeks. You probably can't appreciate what the impact of that is on the human body unless you've actually been through it. Those kind of temperatures are absolutely killing. Scott's carefully laid plans were in tatters, and the lives of his men hung in the balance. The staggering cold had thrown his schedule into disarray, and everyone was nearing exhaustion. The sledges became harder and harder for the straining men to pull. The surface, lately a very good, hard one, is coated with a thin layer of woolly crystals. These are too firmly fixed to be removed by the wind and cause impossible friction on the runners. God help us, we can't keep up this pulling. That is certain. Normally, friction from the sledge melts a thin layer of snow that lubricates the runners as they slide. But below negative 20, the snow remains crystalline and grips the runners tightly. Sir Ranulf Fiennes, a polar explorer who pulled a sledge across Antarctica in 1993, knows all too well what Scott and his men had struggled with. We developed a real feeling for the problems that Scott faced from day to day with the, the variety of snow surfaces and temperatures. If you want to practice it, you want to get two six-foot fat men, put them into a bathtub with no legs, and pull them for in his case 1600 miles over sand dunes. That's the friction that you actually get. There's no sliding. But even as the conditions got worse, Scott made no effort to lighten the load. It is a decision his critics have often cited as a clear indication of his incompetence. Three weeks earlier, the party had spent a day collecting 30 pounds of rock samples on the plateau. So when the going got rough, why didn't Scott dump the extra weight? Fine says lightening the load would have made little difference. Pulling sledges is a very unpredictable thing. You can halve the load of a sledge and have bad snow and go slower than the full load of the sledge with good snow. So the great thing about putting a few rocks, 30 pounds of rocks on their sledges wouldn't have made much difference. They weren't stupid. They weren't going to keep them on the sledge if it was really killing them. They could have just depoted them and come back for them the following year. What was killing them wasn't the, well, the weight of the rocks, it was the friction of the snow. The unyielding surface had a devastating effect on their progress. Instead of averaging 15 miles a day, they could barely manage three and a half. At this rate, they would never make it back to Cape Evans in time to beat the onset of winter when temperatures would drop to an unsurvivable 50 below. To make matters worse, the tailwind that Scott had been expecting, another crucial element of Simpson's forecast, was also failing to materialize. Hope for better things this afternoon, but no improvement apparent. Oh, for a little wind. On the previous journeys back from the depots, the teams had erected sails on the sledges when the wind began to blow from the south. Scott had calculated this added advantage into his plans. So without it, his team was in even more trouble. The wind had aided them before, but this time, the air stayed bitter and still. The surface remains awful, the cold intense, and our physical condition running down. God help us, not a breath of favorable wind for more than a week. The elements were unyielding. They were trapped in a condition we now call a temperature inversion. The reflective surface of the ice loses energy rapidly, creating a layer of cold air sandwiched between the ground and a warmer layer above. Only wind can bring the warm air back down to ground level. But for Scott, the wind refused to arrive. When it's windy, it's actually warm in the Antarctic. I know that sounds terribly counterintuitive, but, but many of the...